I'm Nigel Vanderlinden. This is Collaboration is Culture podcast, exploring how we work together and how to make it better. In this episode, I'm joined by Jeff Sherum, Director of Organizational Effectiveness, Culture and Change at Pratt & Whitney. Jeff focuses on the strategy and leadership of organizational effectiveness, culture, and change within Pratt & Whitney, and helps the team deliver solutions that drive results, evolve the culture, and promote a best-in-class employee experience. Additionally, Jeff is a retired Air Force officer and master executive coach who believes his life work is helping others achieve their leadership, personal, and professional goals. A key element and common theme in his leadership philosophy is a belief in a constant pursuit of better as an individual, team, and an organization. Outside of work, Jeff enjoys spending time with his bride, celebrating and supporting their children's interests in addition to cycling and reading. Jeff has a bachelor's degree in human resources management from Park University, an MBA from the University of Phoenix, and is currently pursuing a doctorate in organizational leadership from Franklin University. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Nigel. I am delighted to be here speaking with you about these really exciting topics, at least exciting to me. <laughs> so today, Jeff and I are exploring how to shape meeting culture for both employee experience and effective outcomes. Jeff, how do you define meeting culture? What, what is it? Yeah, it's, it's such a good question that we're asking this question from meeting culture together. Because meeting culture is how we experience culture. So we think about our organizations and how we interact with each other and how we communicate and how we work together. We do that through the context of meetings. So meetings is how we experience our culture in the organization. And if we can become more effective in meetings, then we become more effective overall, more effective in our goal accomplishment and hitting our targets and doing all the things that we set out to do as a business. So Jeff, I'm, I'm interested to know, how did you develop a personal interest in this topic? So it actually started about five or six years ago. Um, I found myself at a conference. Um, I was one of the, you know, side speakers with small groups at this conference. And in one of the large conferences uh, was an author of a book uh, that uh, I have just I adore this book. I recommend it to everybody. It's called The Surprising Science of Meetings. Um, mm -hmm. And the author, Dr. Stephen Rogelberg, um, captivated my attention when he started talking about um, what he referred to as a meeting tax. Um, and, and the meeting tax is what companies just, we, we just pay for ineffective or inefficient meetings, or, or really just to say meetings not as effective or efficient as they could be. Um, and so when I left that conference and bought the book, um, I'll tell you that I counted today. Um, I have, I have notes, um, I think 17 pages of notes from, from this book. I practically rewrote the book in, in my note taking. Um, so that's what kind of sparked my interest is it, it got me really paying attention to the meetings that I was in and the meetings that were happening around me. The catalyst for where we are today, though, if we think about the meeting six or seven years ago and with Dr. Rogelberg wrote this book, we're kind of in a little bit of a different environment, you know, in this, mm -hmm. I would say post pandemic environment, you know, the, the, the pandemic thrust us all into a very new way of working with a higher leverage of technology usage and, you know, how we're meeting with each other virtually is now, is now the norm. And that came with additional challenges, but what it really did is exacerbated the meeting taxes we were already paying. So go, going on, you know, fast forward to about 10 months ago, um, when our organization started getting really focused on how can we increase our effectiveness overall, I had a, a colleague of mine research some numbers. And I don't think these numbers are uncommon. I think this is probably universal for a medium to large size company, but in a month, a one month period, we have about 300,000 meetings in one wow. month. And these are just meetings that have some kind of virtual platform. So either mm -hmm. Zoom or Teams, this doesn't account for face-to-face -face interaction. So that number is even, even greater. 
And when we look at the 300,000 meetings that we're having, that's over a million participants a month in a meeting. And, wow. you know, you can continue to peel those layers back and figure out how much time are we all spending in meetings and things like that. Um, and so when meetings are not like, for instance, when meetings start late or end late, which is incredibly common across, I'm sure everyone experiences this, that's, it would be an example of a tax that we're paying. Um, and it's just not us being as efficient as we possibly could be. So what makes for a, a good, or dare I say, great meeting culture? Gosh, I, I think we're still pursuing that, but <laughs> some of the things that, that we can experience for a really efficient or effective meeting. Um, and I'll continue to talk about the importance of starting and ending a meeting on time. Mm -hmm. um, so part of, we refer to this when we don't do this, like when we end a meeting late, we refer to this as stealing time from our colleagues. So this is time theft. Um, and if you're the senior leader in the meeting or the meeting host, you typically are the one that decides if a meeting goes long or not or right. starts late right. or whatever. Uh, and we start referring to this as, okay, well, let's acknowledge that we're now preventing somebody from doing the next thing that they were going to do in their day. Um, so I think something so simple, starting and ending on time goes a long way. In, in one, it helps people know what their commitments are in their day. Um, uh, and two, I think it's considerate. There's some other elements of that that I think help. Uh, like, for example, one of the things that we've implemented is compressing our meeting time. And this is a button that if, you, if you're if you an Outlook user, you can go in and check this feature yourself. Reducing mm -hmm. meetings from 30 minutes to 25 minutes and 50 minutes where it would be an hour. And this is simple and it sounds inconsequential, but it really is significant when we think about we're all in back-to-back -back meetings. If I have a meeting that ends 10 minutes before the hour, that's 10 minutes that I can finalize anything from that last meeting, prepare for my next meeting, get a cup of coffee, use the restroom, transition if I'm in person. Um, and so that makes a significant difference as well. So thinking about just time, like how we manage our time in meetings. I think some other things is, you know, sometimes we go to meetings and we don't know why. You know, the, this great phenomenon of Microsoft Outlook has essentially we have essentially given our power to everybody else in the world because anyone can look on my calendar and see that I'm free and book a meeting. Now, if you have a culture that maybe is pretty ineffective with meetings, you may just accept the meeting because you feel rude not to. You're like, well, they invited me. I, I must need to be there. So let me click accept without really knowing what the meeting is about. Why am I there? Why are there 40 other people there, you know, as well? And so I think really being careful about who we're inviting to meetings, why we're inviting them to meetings, giving people permission to decline meetings is, I think, another indicators of a successful uh, meeting culture. And we haven't even gotten into like how the meeting runs. Like, mm -hmm. should you have an agenda? Like what happens at the end of the meeting? Um, so I think there's some some little quick wins that organizations can adopt to in increase or improve their meeting culture. But then I think there are some structural things as well, like how do you actually host a meeting? Why is it important? Why, why should managers, and let's bubble this up, the organization, why should they care? Wow, that's a good question. You know, I, I feel like it comes back to the meeting taxes that we pay. Um, you know, our time, everyone's time is so valuable um, and going to leaving a meeting that has not been productive, like that's time we don't get back. And, you know, then you have to have another meeting to actually do the work that you hope to had accomplished in the first meeting. Um, and, and then there's even the meeting before the meeting that we sometimes have to have. So I think it's just an overall, you know, I think we, we help increase the opportunities to hit our business goals by increasing our effectiveness on how we collaborate and, and how we work together. So I think this, this is a business challenge. Um, I think this goes beyond the, the, you know, let's talk about how great our culture is. I think this actually has, this is business outcomes. Indeed. I wonder if some of those business outcomes also include employee experience and, you know, it's, it's impact, be it positive or negative on the day-to-day -day experience of your employees. 
Oh, for sure. And when you think about it from the employee experience perspective, I, I hear frequently and I've experienced myself where you're in back-to-back -back meetings, you know, maybe most of them are, are hitting the objectives, maybe some are. Um, you don't have time to think, you don't have time to actually do the work that you're committing to doing. Um, it can often lead to, you know, some other issues that we're seeing post-pandemic related to mental health, related to burnout, um, you know, and so by really putting down some ground rules with meetings, like the compressed meetings, I think, does so much for uh, mental health. You know, we have people on, on our team that talk about, well, what do you do in that 10 minutes? And, you know, some of the responses we got was like, I go for a quick walk. Like I go outside and I see the sun. Like I, you know, I go stretch or I stand up and do some exercises. I, I pet my dog. Like these are things that help us become even more effective in the rest of our day. You know, so I think the employee experience part of this is huge. I, I wonder, you know, for those that are listening that are managers or HRBPs, supporting the business, what should they be looking for or listening for to both recognize and acknowledge that we need to create a, a better meeting culture? I think there's a few things. I think we get complacent with recurring meetings. Mm -hmm. So we put meetings on our calendar, we forecast them out for 12 months, but maybe having an intentional revisit of that cadence, like every few months, like every other month or every third month. So we can ask ourselves, is this meeting even still necessary? You know, where can we eliminate meetings that aren't serving us well? Um, and, and I think that's a good start. Um, another thing I think to pay attention to is what Dr. Rogelberg refers to as bloated meetings. Um, and for this, this fascinated me uh, because there's his research shows that if you have any more than I think eight people in a meeting, you'll experience social loafing. Um, mm -hmm. And social loafing in a digital environment equates to multitasking. Like people are logged into the meeting, but they're probably not focused on the meeting. They might be focused on something else, which begs the question, why are you in the meeting? And, you know, why can't you direct your full attention to the other thing that is a higher priority? So I think as, as leaders and as, as HR professionals, like we can start looking at the number of people we have in the meetings um, and is the number of people serving the purpose of the meeting. Um, so this is also to say that it is appropriate to have large meetings sometimes. Like if you're having flowing down communication or, you know, think of like a town hall type of event, um, or you have several direct reports beyond eight, and it's important for everyone to contribute or be a part of the meeting. Um, that That's all perfectly acceptable. But when we're starting to have like meetings where we have five or six members from the same team in the meeting, we got to start wondering, is that four members too many? Do we, do we need all of them uh, in the meeting? And I think that's an area where managers and HR professionals can help out a lot is just starting to pay attention to the volume of participants in the meeting. Are they the right people? Um, who's contributing in the meeting and, and who maybe isn't? Because that might indicate the necessity of that person being in the meeting. Um, I think those are a, a few things they can pay attention to. And, and then, of course, pay attention to the, the obvious things that we want to pay attention to, which is like voluntary controllable attrition. Are people leaving your organization at a higher rate? And does the exit surveys indicate that it has something to do with burnout or, you know, time management type things? Because that could be an indicator that our meetings maybe are where they should be. I'm reminded, at least as it relates to the size of meetings, um, Amazon's rule of thumb, two pizza teams. Yeah. The meeting should yeah. only include enough individuals that two pizzas uh, would feed over uh, a, a lunch. Right. Right. And th that's a great rule of thumb. And, to, you know, two pizzas, that's not much. I I'm thinking, is that, is that seven people maybe? I think that's about seven or eight people. Yeah. So I like their approach. Not as scientific maybe as Dr. Rogerberg, but very practical. Now, who has the responsibility for shaping or in some cases changing meeting culture in an organization? Everyone is probably the easy answer, but I think more than that is buy-in and visible commitment by the most senior leaders in the organization. I think we've, we've learned a couple things in, in our journey 
to increase our media effectiveness. And, and I should caveat with that saying that underneath our pursuit of having a better meeting culture is the overarching culture, which consists of high degrees of trust and empowerment. And we care about employee experience and transparency and communication. So that's kind of the bedrock of all of this. Um, and when we rolled out the pilots of some of the things that we're doing, the feedback we got is, this is great, but it doesn't work unless the entire company is doing it. You know, so as we were testing it in pockets, they're like, well, if I'm the only one paying attention to this, it's not going to work. Um, and so I think that was a good learning is this can't be, this almost can't be a ground up, you know, grassroots effort, like many things that shape our culture are. I think this has to be like intentional. It has to be our most senior leaders saying that this is how we're going to operate as, a, as an organization and showing their commitment to it. And what did that look like at Pratt & Whitney? It was amazing. Um, and, and the reason I say that is we were, we had our, the president of our company, Pratt & Whitney, uh, Shane Eddy, uh, we were in a, uh, a manager all hands. Um, and so all the leaders in the company um, were in this meeting. Um, and Shane essentially said that the meeting essentials, which is what we're calling our meeting effectiveness program, the meeting essentials is one of the ways that we're going to continue to transform our organization um, and that it starts with him. Um, and that was the comment that gave me kind of goosebumps. He's like, wow. it starts with me and my calendar um, and all of my uh, senior level leaders are also buying in. And, and that's how we're going to operate going forward. Talk about a catalyst to change. You know, when you see the most senior leader in the company giving such a public commitment, they've really kind of opened the floodgates for adoption to our meeting essentials. Maybe you can tell us a little more about your meeting essentials program and, and maybe to begin with, how did you start? I feel like Dr. Rolgeberg should maybe give me some kickback for how much I'm mentioning his book. <laughs> But, but I feel like that was, we got a lot from there and we also got a lot from listening to our employees, you know, finding out where are they or where are they experiencing frustration as it relates to our meeting culture. And, you know, of course, the things that we're hearing are, are the things that everyone probably is hearing with meetings going long, maybe not there being a clear purpose or agenda, um, you know, not having enough time to think in our day, like we're just in back to back meetings. Um, I don't think these things are unique to any one organization. I think that's a post-pandemic kind of sentiment. Um, and so these, this is what shaped kind of our thinking. Um, and we also leveraged a partnership, uh, an internal partnership with our digital team. So um, our digital team helped us really uncover what could we do in Outlook that would help automate some of the things that we're trying to do and collect some of the information of how many meetings are we in and things like that. Uh, so that's kind of where we started. In where we landed was, and, and of course we had probably 15 or 20 things that we could roll out and, and try to okay. implement instead of trying to, you know, boil the ocean. We're like, what are the four things that we could use that would probably have the biggest impact and where we landed was, and this is going to be a, an automation solution as well, is every outlook meeting invite, when you open outlook and you click on a time spot. When it opens, there's a template that is that is automatically there now. To we're referring to as our four P's, and and the four P's are purpose, people, preview, and process. And the requirement is that you fill in the details, like what is the objective of this meeting, which is the purpose, who are we inviting, and why. Um, and I've had people like tell me they they've said, well, you can just read the two line to figure out who I invited, <laughs> which is very true. But what this step does is require us to actually think about why did I click the person in the two lines? Yes. So it's that extra level of consciousness on it. Uh, and so people is, you know, who are we inviting and why? Um, preview is synonymous with agenda. Like what are the main okay. items that we're going to cover in this meeting? Um, and process is how are we going to cover these items in the meeting? So some of the things you might see in process is, is there a read ahead? Do you have to do anything to prepare? Will there be slides? And if so, who's sharing the slides? Because how many times are we in meetings where we're like, who's got that open and can share? Like, 
you can put that right in the meeting invite. Um, and so the, the four P's, and this is something that the organization, our leaders are doing very well with, is they're giving us permission to push back if we don't have the four P's in a meeting invite, to be able to reply back to the sender and say, can you please add the four P's before I accept this meeting, which is incredibly empowering to say, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to click accept yet until I understand the four P's. Um, well, before I talk about the other three, I want, I want to share that, uh, testing the four P's. Like I put the four P's in my meeting invite well before we rolled it out. Um, and I sent a meeting to someone I've never met with before. I did the four P's and as we were introducing ourselves, he stopped me and he's like, I almost declined your meeting. And I'm like, why? He's like, cause I didn't know who you were or what this meeting was about. But when I opened the meeting invite, it answered all of my questions. And I knew this was a meeting I should be in. And I was like, there it is. Like, there you go. that's exactly right. Um, and so that automated solution, I think, is helping a lot where I don't have to type purpose. Right. It's like already there. Um, so that's one. The second thing as part of our meeting essentials program is not ending meeting without covering what we're referring to as the three exactly's. And the three exactly's are the exactly what, by exactly who, by exactly when, which is essentially capturing the outcome of the meeting, which is saying like, what are our go do from mm -hmm. this meeting? Who's got them? And when are we expecting some kind of movement or completion on it? Which eliminates the, we, when we leave a meeting unsure of, well, yeah, we listed a bunch of things we're doing, but I'm not sure was I supposed to do that? or with somebody else, and then no one does it, which would which happens. It requires another meeting. Exactly. <laughs> where we have to have another meeting to figure out, did we set up the task list right? So the four P's and the three exactly's are, are helping us within the meeting. The third thing, which I already talked a little bit about, is starting and ending on time in our compressed meetings. So 25-minute meetings and 50-minute meetings. And the funny thing that's happened you know, early on in our feedback with that is we're like, yeah, it's great. I have a 50 minute meeting and then someone books my 10 minutes of free time. Mm. Um, so we had to go back out to the organization. So that's not the intent here. Like we, we're, we're not booking 10 minute meetings now. Um, although I like the idea of a 10 minute meeting. Yes. Um, so we are trying to protect that free time so people can transit to new meetings, you know, take that mental health break that they need to take. So that's the third is starting and ending on time and compress meetings. And I, I would say that we're getting better with that. Me, just the meetings that I'm in, I see it happen. One of the reasons, and, and I think this is, maybe this should be a best practice, is I've started sharing with people that I keep track of my own meeting theft. So when I'm in a meeting that goes long, I have a spreadsheet that I track it. Like how many minutes did this meeting go long? And at the end of the week, I add it up. Um, and I've had weeks of over two hours of time wow. theft, which is a lot. And I've had meet weeks with, you know, 15 or 20 minutes of time theft. But the beauty of it is the people I meet with regularly know that I keep track and they are adamant about ending meetings with me on time because they're like, I, I don't want to be on his tracker. So we are ending on time. It's so, the perfect example of the observation effect. <laughs> that's exactly right. So maybe, maybe that should be part of our meeting essentials is everyone keep track of <laughs> their time theft. So that's the third. The the fourth is is more of, well, I'm trying to think, it doesn't necessarily count as a meeting, I guess I should say. We've asked leaders to, for their teams, create no meeting windows. Mm. Um, and so times of the day or the week where their team is protected from people scheduling meetings with them. The intent here being, this is where we can actually get the work done that we need to get done uninterrupted. Um, or this could be where we're going to take another 30 minutes of mental health time where we're going to go for a walk right. or something like that. Um, and, and what this looks like pragmatically is I sent out, an, ironically, I sent out a meeting notice to my team um, and I blocked a period of time. And the title of my meeting is, this is not a meeting um, and put it on their calendars. So when people try to book meetings with them, they don't see that as free time and they book around it. Now, this doesn't prevent them from scheduling a meeting with somebody that they need to speak with to, to get something done that they need to get done, but it does protect them from other people booking time with them. Um, and so 
those four things is is what we're rolling out at Pride Whitney is our meeting essentials. And the feedback that we're getting is is people appreciate, you know, some of the things that, that this is doing for their day, for their week, for their mental health, for, for their productivity. I am curious, why why not a company wide no meeting pick a day, no meeting Wednesday? And instead, yeah. you know, a a time that the manager decides, I'm assuming in consultation with their team. And, and why does it come from the manager? So we talked a lot about that, actually. And there was good arguments on both sides of that, on why it should be a company-wide thing versus why more of a localized thing. It's, you know, we have a fairly large organization. Mm. It's very difficult for me or anyone else to tell another area of the business when their work time versus meeting time should be. We have global customers, we have global partners, so time zones of course. and things like that. Uh, and so I think giving the, and again, this kind of goes back to our empowerment culture is we're just empowering leaders to make it work the way it works best for them. Um, and if that means it's a 30 minute window every day, so five days a week, there's a 30 minute block of time that's protected, great. Um, if that means it's twice a week, first thing in the morning, Fantastic. So there is some, there is an argument for consistency because then no one's scheduling meetings with each other. So internally that makes sense, but it, it doesn't make sense when our customers are global and our partners are global. I wonder how, how do you keep each other accountable uh, to the, the principles of the Meeting Essentials program? So I think when the, the leadership team set to question meeting advice that don't mm -hmm. have the four P's in it. That was a way of saying, let's hold each other accountable to this. You've, um, you've given them permission. You've, you've yeah. empowered them to do so. Yes, exactly. And one of the avenues that we, we took is we didn't just engage like the leadership team per se in, in the development of this, we engaged their admin because when we think about who really are the gatekeepers right. within the organization. It's the, it's the admins, like they manage the flow of communication. They manage the meetings and who's invited and, and they were brought in very early on in this process to help us think through the meeting essentials. And, and so there were our first early adopters. And so I think that's helping us too with accountability because when, when our senior leaders are doing it, that's role modeling the behavior we want. It makes it a lot easier to hold people accountable to it and hold each other accountable to it. So what's next? How do you see the, the program evolving, recognizing, you know, it's still early in the rollout. So there's a, there's a couple of like, yes, we're early on. I think, I think we're on the right track. People have consistently asked for things like this in the organization mm -hmm. and we're getting a lot of feedback that how this is beneficial to them. We're also still got pockets of the organization where we're trying to still adopt it. I mean, so we're in that, you know, we think about the law of diffusion, like we're very much in the early majority stage. Um, it's going to be a while before we get to the late majority and then the laggards, you know, maybe down the road. So we're going to obviously let that process play out. Um, I think something that might be in the future, which I think would be a game changer, is how do we provide feedback to meeting hosts on mm. the effectiveness of their meetings? Because we, I mean, I don't know of an organization that, that does this very intentionally. I mean, we give leaders feedback on a lot of things. We very rarely give leaders feedback on how effective they are at hosting a meeting. Um, and coincidentally, I don't know that we teach people how to host a meeting. We just, we just, you know, we, we absorb it, you know, by observation. So I think that might be something that if, if we were to continue to build on this is creating a mechanism that provides meeting hosts with feedback on how effective they are at meetings so they can improve, you know, whether it be like, and I actually think I got this out of the book as well, is when leaders were asked how effective their meetings are, the leaders think their meetings are tremendously effective because the people who do the most talking seem to think the meeting is the most effective. And typically that's the host of the meeting. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that's, for me, that was very kind of enlightening, you know, and thinking about the meetings that I hold, um, I try to be very conscious of who's doing the most talking here. If it's me, I probably think this is a great meeting. Everybody else probably doesn't. So how do I bring in more people into this conversation? Uh, so I, I think things like that will maybe be a, a follow on is how do we bring some meaningful feedback to hosts of meetings? 
and maybe some tips and development areas where we can become even better at the, the actual orchestration or facilitation of a meeting. Because right now we're talking like structure of a meeting. We're not necessarily talking about the facilitation of a meeting. So mm -hmm. I think that could be a next step. Well, I'm so interested and excited to hear how this program is both received and evolves as you continue to iterate and improve at, at Pratt & Whitney. Jeff, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast and sharing, again, the great work you're doing at Pratt & Whitney to develop great meeting culture for both employee experience and uh, org effectiveness. Thanks, Nigel. This is, uh, as you could probably tell, I get really excited talking about this. <laughs> um, and I also am really thankful that we're, made, we're ending our meeting on time. Like, <laughs> you're, you're not going to get on my tracker today. Well, I was just about to say, I don't want to be on the tracker. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you. <laughs>